And that's about the point when I'm not sure about the rest. Now, I know for a fact, gathering some facts later, I pretty much flew off the back of the machine, off the back of the treadmill, and landed in the floor back there, maybe slammed up against the wall. Okay, some of you have probably started to realize by now, at least assume that if you find me outside and particularly on my back porch, it may be because we're about to have some pretty serious discussions, maybe air out a few things that typically we might not want to talk about on a general basis. And I want to tell you that's not always going to be the case. However, that is certainly the case about today's video. Today we're going to be talking for just a few moments about denial and how I know it is the case from dealing with so many of you as my friends, uh, my compadres, if you will, fellow transplant patients, or at least those who are waiting for transplant. I understand that denial is something that many times we're going to be guilty of, whether it be the fact that you're completely denying at all that you're sick, or maybe you're more like I am where you know that you're sick, but you're in complete denial to the fact of how sick you are, and maybe that transplant is the only answer that awaits you. That's how I was about 12 years ago or so at least when I started down the main part of my journey in the transplant life. Now, with that being said, I just want to illustrate this by telling you a little bit of a story out of my past that happened about 12 years ago that I think really will give you some insight as to how I felt then, what I was really trying to pull off, if you will, at that time, as well as I hope will allow you to think back and to think about these moments in your life and to consider the fact that you may have also been, as I was, in a deep denial. Now there were several times in my past in these last 12 years or so leading up to transplant, five and a half years or so since, where I can remember many of my family members, particularly my wife Jennifer, looking at me and trying to talk to me about the subject of transplant and basically when I didn't want to talk about it, she would say something to the effect of, Jim, I think you're in denial or you are in denial. And you need to face up to the fact that this is what you're looking forward to and this is your only hope, your only answer. And every time she would say I was in denial, I would immediately get in denial by saying, no, I'm not in denial. I get it, I understand it, and I'm okay with it. When I knew in the back of my mind back there somewhere, that wasn't really the case. But there was one special day, I think about 12 years ago, I'm kind of roughing that, when I really had to meet with denial in a big way. And it really occurred after the transplant doctors had met with me, after they had decided and already made this statement that transplant might be a part of my future, it really started in that very first of what would ultimately be four different evaluations I would go through while waiting to be listed and ultimately transplanted. It was really just one test out of that huge evaluation process, which I've talked about here on videos several times before. I'll link up here in the corners in the description below. But it was during the part of one of those tests of that first evaluation when the, the realization that I was in denial became so evident. And it basically comes down to a day when they called me in, a typical day full of testing, I think the very first test on the docket or the schedule for that day was that I was going to go in for an actual treadmill type stress test. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's exactly what it sounds like. They're going to put you on a treadmill. They're going to ask you to walk, to run, while they're constantly monitoring your heart rate, monitoring your blood pressure, maybe your temperature, a few other things. And while you're moving on the treadmill, they're going to be watching that heart rate and those other signs to see how your body handles the stress that comes with exercise. It's an exercise type stress test, okay? So I can remember that morning, I went in the room, I don't know what time it was, six, seven o'clock in the morning. I walked in the room there, there were a few different technicians in the room. They were cutting up joking among themselves and me being like I was at that time, honestly in denial, I can remember looking at both of them and asking them a simple question, hey, when, when do you get off? What time do you get off? And I think they told me they get off at four, 4.30, something like that. And I said to them, well, uh, you better go ahead and call your husbands and call your family because I'm still going to be walking on this treadmill when it's time for you to get off. So you're not going to be able to go home. And ha ha, I laugh, they laugh, we cut up a little bit. And that seemed like the way things were going to be. As a matter of fact, to be totally honest with you at that point, in my mind, 
I was probably as strong as I'd ever been. It didn't matter to me if I was having some irregular heart rates. It didn't matter to me if my blood pressure wasn't under control like it probably had been in the past. It didn't matter to me that some of the tests had pointed. Obviously, the heart cath I'd had a week or so before was pointing towards stage four heart failure. That didn't matter because I was strong, okay? So here we go. They get me all wired up, hooked up, put on the EKG, put on the blood pressure cuff, uh, that sort of thing and set me up on a treadmill. And of course, I'm not really knowing at that point. I don't have any idea what they're looking for. I don't have any idea at that point how they read these exercise type stress treadmill tests. So I don't know what I'm supposed to be achieving. In my mind, the goal is to walk or run as fast as I can, as far as I can, for as long as I can. And I'm gonna prove that I'm your everyday healthy guy. I think 32 some odd, 30. Or so I don't know I can't do math but a, a pretty young guy and I was healthy that was what I was going to prove okay so I'm on the treadmill now they begin to hit the button and they begin to let it move a little bit and I start walking along with the pace no sweat no big deal and I walk a little bit and I walk a little bit and as we go into this maybe we've been in it you know 30 45 seconds one of the technicians there to my left said Jim are you okay I said sure I'm fine I'm fine I told you I got this call your husband you're gonna be late ha 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 I'm laughing you know and I walk a little bit farther and a little bit farther and as they begin to turn up the pace a little bit I began to realize really quickly that I probably wasn't going to keep up as well with this as I first assumed I would. But, you know, I'm going to hide that. I'm covering that up because I'm strong. So I begin to walk a little faster, a little faster. Now it's gone to kind of a jog point, and I'm beginning to look around. I'm getting curious as to what they're looking for. Uh, I look around. I see the blood pressure monitor over there. I see the heart rate monitor over here, you know, a little live EKG type thing on the screen. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I don't know what they're looking for, but, hey, if I can make it another few minutes, I'll be fine. I'm going to show them. And so here in just a second or two, I don't know how long it had been, maybe 30, 45 more seconds, that same technician said, Jim, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. And she said, okay, then if you need me to stop, we will. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And you probably can hear me reenacting that in my voice. I wasn't necessarily good. But anyway, I kept going. So they turned the pace up a little bit more. Maybe they had some incline to it. I don't know. It felt like they tipped it up to kind of the Mount Everest level. I don't know. But they sped it up a little bit. And I continued to keep up with the pace with my feet. But I knew as far as, you know, my heart rate, as far as my lung capacity, as far as my energy, my stamina, things were going downhill quickly, okay? So... The technician, again, I think now for the third time, asked me, she said, Jim, are you okay? I said, I I'm good. You know, I I that's all I could get out. And, and she said, seriously, if you need to stop, we've been on this thing long enough, we can stop. And I just nod my head, no, no, no. I don't see anything, I just nod my head, no, no. Keep going. And I run a little farther, and she maybe sped it up, maybe another level. I don't know, it felt like she cooked it in the turbo and, and whatever happened. But she asked me yet another time, she said, Jim, are you okay? And, and I don't remember exactly how I reacted. I think my reaction to that certainly was not to talk, but just to, you know, to give her maybe a nod or something like that. And that's about the point when I'm not sure about the rest. Now, I know for a fact, gathering some facts later, I pretty much flew off the back of the machine, off the back of the treadmill, and landed in the floor back there, maybe slammed up against the wall. I don't know. I know based on the pains and the aches that I had afterward, that's about what happened, and that's about what they described happened, okay? I came off the back of this thing, all right? Now, I don't know how many of you used to back in the day, maybe some of you weren't even old enough, but I am, watch the Cosby Show. And on the Cosby Show, that's pretty much what the character Bill Cosby did. He was called in for an exercise stress test, he got on the treadmill, he challenged the ladies, probably where I got my idea, he challenged the technicians, he told them he would be there all day, and he did the same thing. <laughs> he ran out of breath, ran out of injury, he flew off the back, and that's where they knew he had a problem. And folks, that is where they knew I had a problem as well. Because I came off the back of this treadmill, I'm there in the floor, the nurses swamped around me. The technicians swamped around me. I vaguely remember them calling for the doctor who was maybe monitoring the test in the next room through a camera or glass. I don't know. But I remember them scooping up, throwing me back on the table there where they had had me to put the leads on me for the EKG or, or whatever it was, for the monitor, heart monitor at least. 
And I remember them constantly just kind of giving me that, oh, are you okay? You know, slapping my cheeks, trying to cool me down, watching my heart rate. There were conversations going on around me. I was at myself, but I kind of wasn't. I remember hurting so badly, okay? Never in my life. And I, I talked a few weeks ago about post-transplant, the surprises and such, and I was surprised maybe that I hurt so bad after transplant for a time. This was probably just as bad a pain as that. I hurt, everything hurt. From the very top of my head, every hair, to the tips of my toes and out my toenails, I hurt, okay? I hurt so bad and was in such shape at that point, I could taste blood in my mouth where my gums had began to bleed, okay? That's how hard I had either pushed myself or tried to push myself to prove myself that I was fine and to prove to them and to the doctors that I was okay. Nothing was wrong with me, but the truth is something was. Now you see the moral of this story and what happened that day was I realized that I had been in tremendous denial. I realized that day that I was really sick. That regardless of what I wanted to think, regardless of how I wanted to, to look at this situation, I was really sick, okay? I found out later about that stress test that I just told you about. I found out later that even though that sounded like and seemed like an eternity to me, I stayed on the treadmill under a minute, under a minute. And so as healthy as I thought I was, I made it on the treadmill under 60 seconds. Not good, folks. I was in denial. But the blessing of this little story that I've told you, true story based on actual events, the blessing of this true story is it was also that day that I came out of denial and began to realize what my real current at that moment situation was and I began to shift gears into more of a let's get this fixed, let's move forward, and let's get better. And I learned a great lesson that day. So I don't know what it is or was about your transplant journey that has or did cause you denial, but I know this, you're not serving yourself by being in denial. Considering reality, considering the truth of what's going on, and being willing to kind of more or less go with the flow as we say, and let things happen will be your next step toward healing. It'll be your next step toward getting better, toward getting stronger, and toward improving and changing your life. I promise you that. I appreciate you joining me today on this program. I appreciate all of you out there. I love you to death, those of you who watch these videos on a regular basis. I certainly appreciate all of you who, like you probably want to do today, if, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Give it a like. If you've not already subscribed, today is the moment to subscribe because I'm putting out videos every week, two or three times a week, typically on Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. Central. These videos are for you, they're for me, they're for all of us to share, they're for all of us to enjoy, and more importantly, to learn from. It's my goal in life to advocate, educate, and motivate you as a transplant patient. And believe it or not, that's what this video is all about. Stop your denial, start coming to a realization of what situation you're in, and start considering how to fix it. And until next time, stay stronger, friends.